Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the Nimzo Indian, <clears throat> but we're going to do one variation at a time, and today's variation is the Samish, or properly pronounced, the Zamish variation of the Nimzo Indian, and as you see, I have the board set up so that we are going to analyze it from the black perspective. So let's get started. And some of these notes and ideas are based off um, uh, some theory that we have looked at recently. So let's start off with D4, Knight of six, C4, E6. I think the name of this book is, uh, I think it's The Everyman's Guide to the Nimzo Indian by uh, John Ems, and that's uh, where we're basing uh, most of our notes off of. So, of course, Nimzo Indian, most of us that have been playing chess for a while know that this is the beginning of the Nimzo Indian defense. In contrast to the Queen's Indian defense, which would start out like that. A knight f3, knight c3, bishop b4 marks the beginning of the Nimzo Indian defense. <clears throat> so what is the Zamish variation? Well, the Zamish variation is a3 straight away and basically it is probably probably one of the oldest responses to the Nimzo Indian nowadays we see the classical variation Queen C2 we see the Rubinstein variation with E3 and we also see the Kasparov variation with uh, with Knight F3 those are the main lines we see and probably the most popular are Queen C2 and E3 systems. The Zamish system with A3 is basically a, a direct attempt to refute the Nemzo Indian defense and if the uh, Zamish were uh, basically like any any good or really good, it would put the it would have put the Nimzo Indian out of business a long time ago as a viable defense, uh, especially at Grand Master level. And since that we know that the Nimzo Indian is still played at the highest levels of chess, we know that the uh, Zamish, uh, although can although tricky is uh, there's an um, adequate antidotes to the problems that face black in this situation so with the direct immediate a3 white is clarifying the position here basically he's asking black okay you're pinning my knight I'm gonna challenge the bishop right away and you're either gonna retreat that bishop back to e7 whereby black will white will love to play e4 and have a huge center or you're gonna give up your bishop okay so he forces black immediately to exchange the bishop for the knight um, and you might ask yourself why would white use up a move just just to uh, basically have black do something that he would want to do anyway which is uh, double the C pawns um, from white's point of view uh, white is clarifying the situation as I had said and now he can focus on uh, other things and like I said before if this were a real threat then the Nimzo Indian uh, from the black side would be uh, you know out of business so but this is a good variation to know if you're playing black because it is a surprise weapon 
So let's move on. Basically, what White is doing is questioning Black's whole strategy. So, and basically, what he's saying is that he thinks so. He he thinks basically Black's uh, opening is dubious, and that he's just gonna refute it by playing a three, and uh, give getting Black to give up to a uh, Bishop pair, and then trying to set up a huge, uh, cent, um, a huge center. So this is a battleground, and in this particular um, study, we're gonna look at the move B6. And basically, with this simple idea of bringing the bishop to b7, concentrating on the e4 square along with the knight. Also, since these pawns are doubled on, on the c file, there's another weakness for black to attack. And you'll see in some games coming up that. Bishop a6, knight c6 to a6, ganging up on the weakness of the c pawn is uh, one of Black's uh, main ideas. Okay, so going into our first game, this is the game Lebensky with the white pieces versus Brodsky with the black pieces. And this is from the Ukrainian Championship in 2005. Okay, so d4, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, is a3 right away, bishop takes c3, check, b takes c3, b6, and f3. <clears throat> Now here, John Ames poses an interesting question. He says, "Hey, where does this dark square, this light square bishop belong on b7 or a6?" Let me think about that for a second. <clears throat> now, with the move f3, White is basically uh, staking a dominant claim to e4. This move e4 pretty much is not going to be stopped however <clears throat> with all these pawn moves white it lags behind in development uh, somewhat and on a C file he does has have these weakened pawns so therefore B6 gives black the flexibility of going to A6 And the reason why bishop a6 is important is because black's idea is to pile up on this c pawn right here with the maneuver knight c6 and a5 to win this pawn. And so that's that's the idea. And if you think about it, it's a logical continuation of the plan emanating from bishop b4 in the opening to inflict the double pawns because why would you give your opponent double pawns and then not exploit the double pawns you know or give inflict double pawns on the opponent and then allow him to easily untangle his pawns or trade him off so black has given up the bishop pair early in the game so therefore his compensation is those double pawns so one of the main strategies is that he needs to attack those those weaknesses as a result so the the underlying lesson is be consistent know why you're doing something and stick with it. you you give white the double pawns okay now attack the double pawns okay so bishop a6 is correct so let's look at bishop b7 for instance so bishop b7 looks respectable right you would play that Right, because that's playing my role, right? Because there's no real purpose uh, for Bishop B7 is biting on granite, granite here. So let's look, for example, after E4, right? D6, Bishop D3, 
Knight BD7, Knight E2, castles, castles, right? And black is somewhat passively placed, right? His piece, he, his pieces look okay. Like you, you can play a move like Queen uh, E7 here or something like that. But black is a little passive. And what does that mean? It means that it'd be hard for him to create counterplay. You know. Meanwhile, white has a huge, huge center bishop here, and he'll be able to build up an attack on the king side. So, for instance, c5, which white can pretty much ignore because he has his pawn backing up. So, if any exchange here, this pawn will be there. So knight g3, rook c8, bishop b2, queen c7, f4. Now the pawns start to roll. Rook f d8, e5, knight e8, queen e2. And you can see that this is the type of position that black must avoid don't get rolled up on the on the king side like that and that was from the game Chalov Pandavos from Kavala 1999 remember this position you do not want this position as black getting rolled up on you know um, gangland style on the queen on the uh, king side okay so that's why we play bishop a6 first. You want to avoid that kind of situation. So after bishop a6, we're attacking this pawn right away. e4. And with e4, white solves his problem of the unprotected c pawn and he establishes his broad center. Now here, Ams ask another question. Where should black develop his queen's knight? Should you go to c6? Or after the move d6, here. Now, if you were listening to me earlier, you would know the answer. Remember I said the plan is to attack the double pawns, the weak pawns. So therefore, the knight should go here to c6 with the idea of bouncing the a5 so knight c6 again d6 bishop d3 knight bd7 is solid but again you black is kind of slow on the, on the uh, counterplay and you get rolled up on Okay. And now interesting too here is after this move d6, bishop d3, and say he tried to do knight c6 here, it's a problem because now this, this uh, diagonal from e8 to a4 has been open and notice the knight is on priest. So now it's a blunder because after queen a4, the bishop is attacked and the knight is attacked. And then after bishop b7, then d5, exploiting the pin and winning a piece. So we got to be careful. So again, after e4, knight c6 is the best move. And as long as you remember that plan of targeting the c4 pawn, then it's easy to remember the moves. Don't try to remember the move. You remember the plan. If you if you can remember the plan, then the moves will just come to you. So we're attacking the c4 pawn. So we had the bishop there, and then this knight is gonna go here. Bishop d3. And just so you know, bishop g5 and e5 will be looked at in other games. Okay. Knight a5, you see, consistently sticking with the plan. Another question, 
Shouldn't Black finish his development first? I would say Castle before he does anything else. That's a good question. Black can Castle there. And some of the positions will transpose. But by attacking C4 as quickly as possible, Black is trying to take the initiative. So <clears throat> keeping White busy with these threats, you know, causes uh, White to uh, s slow his own plans down. And that's what you want to do in this kind of position because that center <clears throat> that White has can be very dangerous once it gets going. White's main problem right now in the position is his lack of development. <clears throat> so you don't want to, you don't want to really want to go blow for blow with him in development. Like you castle and he does something and you move up because what's going to happen is with his big center, he's going to wind up with a big advantage. So you got to kind of like attack that center before he's able to really fortify it. Okay, so back to this game. E5. <clears throat> White could defend the C4 pawn. If, if you notice, he didn't bother to defend the pawn. Like White could have played Queen E2 or something like that. So White could defend the C4 pawn immediately. But it's tempting to advance in the center and force the knight to move again. Because you figure like what, you know, who cares about defending this pawn? I'm going to attack. <clears throat> so, for example, queen e2. And typical is, for instance, d6. Right? Knight h3. Right? Because the uh, e2 square is now blocked, so the knight has to come out. Now, now, here's here's a question. So now we have the c4 pawn attacked twice, right, by the knight and bishop. Excuse me. The c4 pawn is attacked twice by the knight and bishop here and here. And it's also defended twice by the queen and bishop. So... How can we attack, continue our attack on that pawn? Okay, this is how, queen d7. And the idea is to go to a4, right? And a4 is not the only move, queen c6 it does, does the same thing. Queen a4 or c6 and then you have this triple attack on this pawn. For example, rook b1. And the idea is after queen a4, then white will play rook b for attacking the queen. So continuing on, castle, knight f2, e5, c5, exclamation mark, bishop, bishop takes d3, knight takes d3. E takes d4, c takes b6, a takes, c takes d4, king b7, and castle. And this was good for white. You can see there's a nice center, and open files to attack. And that game was uh, D. Bokarov versus uh, Predoyevic, and that was Moscow 2011. Why is white better here? His center is very strong. He got rid of his weak c4 pawn. And he has good attacking chances against the black king. Like I mentioned, he has a semi-open b file. Semi-open c file. White's, white's king is right in the middle, lined up with the rook. Pawn is missing off the uh, the a file. It looks like a car without, you know, like hubcaps. You know, missing rims and stuff. The, the king side defense... Uh, for black looks looks a little suspect okay so that's promising for white instead of castle there c5 is more of the type of move that you want to um, 
look for. Now, with C5, notice it prevents this move that we spoke about earlier, right? Now, are you ready to do that again? And black can now bring another piece to bear down on the C4 pawn with rook C8. So, idea in total is queen A4 now, right? And then after queen A4, you bring the rook to C8 which lines up on the file and the idea is to capture and now you have four pieces all lined up on the c4 pawn so let's go so for instance castle there's queen a4 bishop f4 attacking this pawn knight takes c4 d5 e5 Bishop g5, knight d7, the idea is to play f6, knight f2, f6, bishop c1, b5, and the game went on, white, white just didn't have enough for play for the pawn, because white just basically dropped the pawn, and he has no you know no big time attacking chances or anything and that game is uh, from V Bellows you know both Grand Masters by the way versus V uh, Fedosev and that's from St. Petersburg 2011 okay so now I'm gonna go back Okay, so queen e2, and okay, so back to the game. Here's queen e2 again, and here's another move that uh, instead of queen e2 d6, uh, black can play queen e2 and knight b3. And this move is less critical and, um, you know, probably a little safer. Like, it's not as sharp as playing d6. This move right here is real simple. The idea is just to simply just gain the bishop here. So, you can always bail out. Like, if you want to try to win that uh, c4 pawn and stuff, you can just bail out with knight b3. And, you know, you're attacking the rook and bishop, so... The rook's going to move somewhere, and you just gain a bishop, you know, bishop pair. So after rook b1, knight takes, rook takes c1. Okay, now, doesn't this reduce pressure on the c4 pawn? Of course it does. But the positive side for black is that white has, you know, lost a bishop pair. You know, and that's in the black in the dark square. Bishop is um, used mightily on in the king side attack for pinning this knight, etc. So it's kind of like you made a trade off. You know, you you lost pressure on the c4 pawn, but you've relieved yourself by trading a major attacking piece from um, from the white side, and then these two pawns are still weak. So. It's not, you know, it's not going to disappear, so you still have chances to attack. So, for instance, after castle, e5, knight h5, they're coming here. You got all kind of stuff coming too with that. Or, you can just drop back to knight e8. But anyway, the idea after knight h5, knight h3, and queen h4 check. And black is okay. So, you can either choose to attack that c4 pawn like that, or just bail out <clears throat> and gain the bishop pair. So, after knight a5, e5, now we're back to the game. And knight g8. If knight h5 here with the idea of queen h4 
Now, let's look at this position real quick because it looks it looks pretty good because black is still threatening the C4 pawn and threatening this check right here on H4. But the problem with this this is that after knight H3, white also has um, a threat here. I don't know if you can see it. I'll give you a second to try to try to see it real quick. All right. If black takes on c4, right? That's what he wants to do. All right. Bishop takes c4. Then bishop takes c4. Knight takes c4. G4. And the problem here is this knight has nowhere to go. So therefore, black has to play this check, queen h4. And after a simple knight f2, what do you do about this knight? The knight, the knight is just lost. And this move doesn't work because this knight is also protecting rook. So there's a little tactical thing there. And if instead of bishop takes c4, which is an obvious mistake, if queen h4 right away, then just simple king to f1. And white has another threat here. Can you see it? The threat is to trap the queen. It's bishop g5. So, for instance, h6 to stop that. Knight f2. And then you had the same problems. If bishop takes c4, the same trap against the um, the knight. Okay, so king f1, h6. And the same thing happens again. So... But don't feel bad if you play knight h5. And eight. I mean, it looks like a, a good move, but it's just uh, just remember that the knight h5, there's no real way to retreat. So if this whole thing doesn't work, then that knight is trapped. And like I just showed you, it doesn't work. So this is why Brodsky played knight g8. And he loses time here. But this is, uh, you know, there's a lot of give and take in chess. And this is kind of like the price black has to play for getting this early attack in on the C4 pawn. Remember, we were, wanted to castle earlier and all that stuff. This is th the trade-off. Black is getting this early attack on this pawn, but he, get, he got pushed back in the center. So knight g8. Queen a4. Queen a4 protects protects this pawn. And also, of course, pins the uh, d pawn. And also, kind of hinders this piece from moving because of the discovery against the bishop. Okay. Brodsky plays the move c5. Now, do you understand c5? That's the question. So let's let's break it down, because this is one of the key moves in the Nimzo Indian, many variations. So what does it do? First of all, it fixes the weakness, fixes the c4 pawn. This pawn isn't going. This pawn isn't gonna advance or, or any of that jazz. That's the first thing. That's what you want to do with weaknesses. You want to fix the target so that you can concentrate your forces on it. You don't want to move in target in chess. You want to fix target. So c5 fixes it. Okay. Number two, it gives black more space in which to operate on the queen side. Number three. 
it allows black to exert more pressure on c4. How? Queen c7 and rook c8. Remember what I told you before because this is imminent. Once that exchange is made, this pawn becomes more exposed. Next, it also attacks the white center, namely the d4 pawn, as we see there. And indirectly, it attacks this pawn also because by destroying the base of the chain, you start working on other parts of the chain, start weakening the head also. Now, White is given the opportunity to play D takes C5 if the right opportunity arises. And again, you'll see you see that in a classical variation where where D takes C5 is played, but it has to be when the right opportunity arises. Because remember, one of the main advantages in this position for White is the two bishops, and bishops are effective in the open position. Another point in this position. Notice that with this pawn pushed on e5, d6, these dark squares are weakened, right? And f6, but definitely d6. So you do not want a piece on there. You do not want this knight coming here, or any piece for that matter. You got to keep an eye on that. So black always has to keep those considerations in mind when deciding. Um, whether to play c5 or not. You got to think of the positives and the negatives. You know, so the negatives are, you know, weak and dark squares around around the king. Um, white have an opportunity maybe at the right time to play uh, d takes c5, opening up the position for the bishops. Um, you know, but the, the uh, pros for black... Like we said earlier, black can exert more pressure on c4. He's attacking the center, fixing the c-pawn, get gaining more space on the queen side. So you got to kind of weigh the pros and cons and then decide, okay, it's time to hit with c5. So in this, in this instance, I think it's good. Okay, so M's ask a question. Can you find a tactic for black? If white plays D takes C5. Okay. So during the game. Bishop E3 was played. Putting more pressure on C5 square. Because. If D takes C5. It's a tactic here. And that can be met by Bishop takes C4. Bishop takes C4. Queen H4 check picking up the piece that's a weakness created by f3 earlier check it out again look at it now that you saw the combination now look at it from here so c5 and he plays d takes c5 now you should be able to see it clear look at the dark squares from the h4 diagonal to the e the e1 square you see the, the kings exposed in this area over here You see, now you see it clearly. And that's why that combination works. And both knights are actively placed here. And uh, the C1 bishop is not looking too good. That's a, this is what you call a bad bishop, my friend, locked inside. Locked inside his pawn chains, all the pawns are on dark squares, and this is what black will love the ideal in the ideal world. Black will continue uh, fighting for you know dominance over the light squares as he's doing, and uh, you know his his plan will be simple: is connect these rooks, you know, move like king e7, take this rook, put it on the c file. And then, you know, play a move like rook a4. Because it's clear. This position is clear. These are your two main weaknesses right here. So you're going to pile up on those. 
okay so that's that's what would happen in that position if d takes c5 happened but in our game bishop b3 was played queen c7 and remember the idea piling up on the c file and then opening things up okay so he defends c5 and he attacks e5 right indirectly remember now if he goes like that you see the attack on e5 look at that so he's discovering d takes c5 right so he's attacking and defending at the same time and that's what's, what's you know uh, signs of strong master play is you you try to find the most efficient moves moves that um perform a lot of duties at once you don't want to waste any any moves any opportunities okay so queen c7 okay and besides um you know indirectly attacking e5 in case the d takes e5 thus protecting this pawn it also sets up you know ideas of c takes d4 and attacking the c the uh, c4 pawn rook c1 so now white defends against the c takes d4 ideas by reinforcing indirectly the c4 pawn okay so it looks it looks great Knight e7 was played, and knight e2. Now here, white, excuse me. Now here, black found a very, a very strong idea here. Played queen c6, challenging the queen. And this move is powerful because after this move. Uh, white is no longer able to hold on to the pawn, to the c4 pawn. So, if you notice, white's whole strategy has been to hold that c4 pawn. The bishop here, queen here, rook here. And now that he can no longer hold the pawn, the whole position will fall apart because he's based his whole strategy around that idea, that one idea. So, the queen c6. He played queen c2 and he's threatening this pawn right here now let me just show you if queen takes c6 knight e takes c6 again we had this pressure here and this time however black does not need to capture here to attack this pawn he can simply just capture it because the bishop and knight outnumber just the bishop and the c4 pawn is going to drop and if white tries d takes c5 now we see why the knight is on c6 because now this pawn this is going to be played so that's why white played queen c2 bishop takes c4 just simply winning the pawn and not just winning the pawn, but now he's gaining some squares in the position. By removing that c4 pawn, now d5 is available to the knight. Whereas a move earlier, it was not. Game continued. d takes c5. Knight d5. Attacking an unprotected piece here. And we can see why his position is slowly crumbling. Bishop f2. B takes c5. Bishop takes c4. And if you just wanted to see what that looked like, that loses. Because now the king is forced to, to capture. After bishop takes e2, king takes e2. Of course, the queen can't take because the rook will capture the bishop on h7. So king takes e2, g6, now the piece is trapped, and bishop takes g6, looks looks uh, respectable, but after knight f4, check, and the 
bishop is just captured. So that's why bishop takes h7 and work. So simply, bishop takes c4 was played by Lebensky. Knight takes c4. Queen e4. And knight d e3. Just getting deep into the position, threatening here in some cases. Threatening to further um, destroy the pawn structure of white. And inter interestingly enough, now it is white who inflicts double pawns on black, which he can afford in this case because his pieces are so his pieces are so much more superior that he's dominating dominating the position. This pawn is hanging. This pawn is hanging. His knights are beautifully placed and just totally um, hinder white's movement. So this is why black has a great ending. So knight f4, castle's queen side, bishop takes, knight takes e3 just in desperation. He gives up his last bishop just so he can uh, develop. Knight c4 is attacking this pawn. Okay, quick question here. Knight d5 looked logical. Why did black choose knight c4? Well, black's knight on c4 hits e5, weakness, and a3. And remember, it's about attacking weaknesses. So that's what makes it that's what makes it um a stronger move. And it avoids the trade because, for instance, knight d5, just offering trade, knight d5, uh, excuse me, knight d5 offering a trade, that's still good for black. Black is winning as a better pawn structure, but it's not as straightforward as in the game. Knight c4 preserves the better knight. This this black knight right here on c4 is better than this knight here on f4. So he so he avoids the trade of pieces there and keeps his good knight and now and it's attacking two pawns. So that's why knight c4 is better. Knight d3, rook d5, protecting and attacking, uh, protecting c5 and attacking e5. So f4, king, c7. Right? Notice black is not rushing. But Brodsky gradually improves the position. And leaves the knight on the c4 square. Having great influence on e3 and d2. And notice, right? You see king c7, right? How many of you would have rushed and played knight takes a3 here? That allows black back into the game. First of all, black is not uh, fully developed. He has this pawn here, knight here. And white would have played c4, d4, rook a1. And now you attacked on this a file at the knight takes c4. Rook takes a7. With this threat, as well as threat on a 7th rank. This just looks dangerous. So king c7. Getting all the pieces into the game. And there's an old saying that uh, is attributed to Capablanca. I don't know if he said it or not. Because... Uh, you know, sometimes you read and hear a lot of anecdotes. You don't know if stuff is true, but if it's a good if it's a good piece of knowledge, you know, you might as well, you know, take a hold of it and keep it. You know, it can't hurt. And what Capablanca allegedly said was position. He had a saying: position over material. In other words, don't ever ruin your position. Going after material, you build your position. You make sure your position is strong, 
then the material will come afterwards. So always remember that position over material. In this move, King C7, you know, you know, f falls right in line with that, with that ideology. Is black improves the position. He plays King C7. He's like, hey, I have to get this rook into the game. I have to make sure my position is solid. His knight is here restricting the king's movement. He maintains the pressure on a position. Understanding that, hey, I'm better. I'm up I'm up material. All I have to do is improve, you know, just keep my position strong and everything else will fall into place. After King C seven, going back to the game, Rook H F one. Of course, black uh, white desperately wants to get back into the game and this it hurts white because white wants to play f f5 but this pawn is under pressure it's like that old song david bowie under pressure doom 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 do, do. under pressure right so rook b8 rook's coming to the open file so now it's more pressure rook can come here here you know, eventually after this knight is removed, there's all kind of um, tactics born. Rook can come here and even here. He plays rook c2, trying to guard that second rank. And for instance, after rook b1, then slick move right here, rook bd8. Double attacking this knight. Rook F D one and now you can play knight takes a three because after rook a one knight b five c four it looks like black made a mistake but nope knight c three check there's the fort coming to the rescue and that's winning for uh black <clears throat> Now, if black, if white tried to improve by playing 26a4, this move rook b3, again, leaves him tied down positionally. So back to the game, rook c2 was played instead of trying to contest the open b file. Knight takes a3. There it is. Rook a2. Rook b3. And you see the dominant dominance of the position. The position is supreme, and since Black's position is supreme, the material just falls. There's no counterplay by White or anything. So he's just getting rocked. You know, Rook C1, A5, Knight BD2, C4, just locking, locking things up. Knight d1, knight b5. Again, the a pawn cannot be taken. Can you see it tactically? If rook takes, there will be a discovered attack, attack after knight takes c3. And that rook will be taken off the board. Rook a4, challenging c4 pawn. Rook a3. Rook takes a3. Because if rook takes here, then let's see. If rook, it looks like a bad move. Let's see. Rook takes rook here. Get back to that rook. So rook a3 was played. He took knight takes rook a1 knight b5. Same thing. If rook takes here, then knight here with the discover check. King e1. So now he moves out the way. He pushes. 
Now, let me ask you this. Can white take the A4 pawn? Okay, you can pause if you want to. I right, take a second to think about it. The answer is no. Well, he can, but he'll be losing. If he takes the A4 pawn, then the same thing with the fork. Rook takes D1, draws the king closer, and then that's going to be followed by knight takes C3. Okay, so in the game, the actual game, knight E3 was played. Now, here's another chance for you to pause the video if you would like. Let's try to find Black's next move. Because now, this is a challenging time. This knight is challenging the rook on d5 and this pawn. This is also a challenge because the knight has been removed from there. Hmm. So what can black what can black do here? Okay. And he's found an excellent move, Brodsky. Knight takes C three. Powerful, powerful, powerful move here. And Lebensky played knight takes C four. Of course, all the inquiring minds out there want to know what happens if knight takes d5 check right take the material c takes d5 and the problem is is now you have a knight versus three pass pawns and a rook and white has no chance for example king d2 right attacking the knight d4 protecting the knight king c2 king c6 Rook f1, and there goes that pawn, a3, f5, e takes, rook takes, a2, king b2, d3. Now the tactics start because the king can't be drawn to capture the knight because of the queening possibilities. Therefore, rook f1, knight d5, king a2, and there's two moves, knight e3. Attacking the rook and guarding the queening square, or you could do d2 first. That's why he did not go in for knight takes d5. Instead, he played knight takes c4. However, after rook d4, there's a double attack here on the knight and the pawn. That wins the third pawn. So rook takes f4. Rook a3 attacking the knight. Rook e4. King f2. Rook e2 check. King f3. And black resigned. Excuse me. White resigned. Excuse me. After king f3. Rook takes b2. And rook takes c3. Can you find the winning move here if the game had continued? Well, it's really simple. Black is up. Three pawns here. And simply, the fastest way to win this is just forced to trade the rooks. King is here. Rook is here. Pawn is here. And the rook would simply be forced to trade. And this would go on to queen. And there's many games like that. And the same as Nimzo Indian. Black wins many games like that. Because white doesn't have to make any obvious looking mistakes in the opening for him to lose. A lot of the moves were very logical. Right? He tries to protect C4. And then next thing you know, he's dropping a pawn. And black has a winning position. Okay? So that was our first game. In the series on the Zamish Nimzo Indian. I hope you enjoyed that. Please like, subscribe, comment, and uh, we hope to be bringing you some more quality analysis in the future.
All right, I'll catch you on the next one.